Welcome back and good afternoon. Before we go to the first speaker again, we would like to remind everyone to send their questions, email their questions to ipwebcast at cdc.gov. Our next speaker is Omar Arroyo. He is the operations manager at the Agriculture Programs and Trade Liaison at the Agriculture Bioterror Countermeasures, Customs and Border Protection. He will discuss the regulatory role of the Customs and Border Protection at the U.S. Ports of Entry. Omar? Good afternoon, and thank you for the invitation. Um, ABTC, or Ag Bioterror Countermeasure, is a division within Agriculture Program Trade Liaison, Office of Field Operations with CBP. We facilitate trade and travel. We regulate for pest exclusion and disease exclusion. We prevent the entry of terrorists and the tools of agro and bioterrorism. We have 328 ports of entry, 16 pre-clearance port, 19 express consignment facilities, and we have 182 ports with agriculture specialist presence. We have a total of 2,417 ag specialists nationwide. We cover land, air, and sea. The agriculture component within Customs and Border Protection was created via a memorandum of agreement between USDA and Customs and Border Protection for plant pest pathogen exclusion. The ag specialists are responsible for inspecting all agriculture importations for compliance with USDA and other federal agencies' regulations. We regulate plants and animals. We're responsible for collaborating with Fish and Wildlife, USDA, CDC, FDA, and other agencies. CBP is responsible for all U.S. imports. We protect human, animals, and wildlife. We collaborate with the Office of Health Affairs when, whenever there's a, a disease outbreak. For example, tuberculosis, measles, Ebola, Sika chikungunya. We assist other agencies at ports of entry, when passengers arrive, even abroad in our preclearance stations. We can prevent passengers from boarding aircrafts and other carriers if CDC so requests. They won't board, they won't get into the United States. Immigration policies cover under the Immigration and Naturalization Act render foreign nationals infected with a communicable disease of public health significant inadmissible into the United States. CDC guidance to CBP follows RING, which stands for recognize, isolate, notify, and give support. During the Ebola situation last year, CBP was doing temperature checks on passengers from Ebola countries from West Africa. We did this in JFK, Chicago, Newark, Washington, Dulles, 
and Atlanta. We will refer any public health situation to CDC to include uh, unaccompanied minors on the southern border, especially if they're uh, found to be infected with ticks, tuberculosis, and we expect CDC to med mitigate the risk before actually admitting into the country. The photo on top is bushmeat. As it was mentioned before, it includes African brush-tailed percupine, duiker, and other artiodactyls, drill monkey, and other unidentified species. Agriculture specialists do not have training on identifying animal species. So we relied on our partner agencies, Fish and Wildlife, CDC, and sometimes USDA to make that identification. For us, it's just meat. And as it was mentioned, unless we can see a claw, a snout, we can't identify the species. <laughs> When we encounter bushmeat or declare, or any meat declare as bushmeat, we will call CDC, Fish and Wildlife, sometimes FDA, USDA, Vet Services. And if we need to transfer custody to them, we will do so. If the meat is not transferred to any of the agencies, we will treat it as unknown meat and seize on their 9 CFR using USDA authority. On the bottom left, you'll see some um, bongo drums from Haiti. In 1974, we had a seizure or an interception in Florida, similar to this one and the hide used was found to be infected with anthrax. Subsequent investigations revealed that 96 out of 368, 26% of those goat skin used on handcraft were infected with bacillus anthracis, all from Haiti. Monkeys turtle eggs, African rodents, bats, are allow entry only for scientific, educational, or exhibition purposes, as per CDC guidance. Monkeys and bats are hosts for infectious diseases, such as Ebola and Marburg disease. Freshwater snails are carriers of parasit parasitic worms that can cause schistosomiasis and account for approximately 10,000 human uh, deaths per year. There's restriction on turtles, tortoise, and other terrapins due to salmonella. We will refer any encounter of these animals to CDC quarantine officers. And if we need to transfer custody, we will do so. Dog importations. We will notify CDC quarantine officers if the dog is younger than three months or if it, they don't have the rabies vaccine. And under their guidance, a confined agreement will be signed. This is done on a case-by-case -case basis as per CDC guidance. If a dog arrives dead, we will notify CDC, USDA, and the airline. And probably more documentation will be needed and disinfection of the carrier. Dogs that are gonna be used on a farm may require more documents. For example, if those dogs are coming from a country with screw worm, then we need more documents to prove that those dogs 
don't have screw worms. What are etiological agents? Are microorganism and microbial toxins that cause disease in humans such as bacteria, fungi, and parasites. Materials containing etiological agents such as blood, serum, uh, any other test kits or blood products will be referred to CDC also. Human remains. Vectors that carry human diseases like mosquito, ticks, fleas, snails, and bats. Hand carry microorganisms are permissible and require advanced notification to CBP to facilitate the process of entry, especially if they're hand carry. That will help us facilitate entry. Human remains are refer to CDC quarantine officers. If we can verify the reason of death, we need to be sure that the person did not die of a communicable disease. What conditions are this if they're embalmed in a hermetically sealed casket? They're cremated or accompanied by a CDC permit, then they will be allowed to enter the United States. There are many biological agents that can cause harm to the agriculture industry. And we require permits to allow them in, especially bacteria, viruses, fungi, and protein toxins. Conotoxins is a pe pe peptide made of 8 to 32 amino acids that are produced by marine cone, cone snails that paralyze their prey. They work by blocking and in in inhibiting various part of the nervous system. The importation of select agents is strictly via commercial cargo environment. It's not allowed in passenger hand carry bags. You need a permit and it must be commercial. Advanced notification of the importation of a select agent and toxin is required and recommended to facilitate entry. Non-compliance with permits or licenses will delay the importation and may warrant a referral to APHIS, CDC, whether it's DSAT or AXAS. All costs incurred in safeguarding that material will be paid by the importer, not by CBP or any partner agency. It will be the importer's responsibility or the carrier, as per 19 CFR. Additional pass exclusion protocols used by Act specialists are used in compliance agreement of garbage, international garbage. Foreign garbage are high risk potential entry pathways for pathogens and pest diseases that can cause damage to the agriculture industry and even humans. We use USDA compliance agreement to enforce maritime, air, railroad, incinerators, caterers, haulers, and military bases. A compliance agreement gives legal permission to the holder to handle regulated materials. We have approximately 1,630 compliance agreements nationwide. Both USDA and CBP inspectors will take part in the process in the issuance of that permit or compliance agreement. 
Garbage entering the United States must be handled and destroyed by a person or firm that has a compliance agreement. We will do this in incinerators or autoclaves. They all certify. We verify yearly that they're actually complying with everything that's stipulated on those compliance agreements. We do spot checks. We follow the trucks. We go and observe them. We board the aircraft. We see how they handle everything from A to Z, from the moment that it was removed from the aircraft until it's destroyed. We don't monitor the entire process once, but we will do spot checks on every transition point. We will perform baggage, baggage examinations, document reviews at all ports of entry. We use x-ray machines to assist us and facilitate, but it's only a tool. If we receive advanced notification, it help us. We identify the shipment, we identify the passenger, and we expedite the process. If this doesn't happen, we need proper labeling on the packages. That way we can identify what you're carrying. If you don't comply with DOT regulation, it will delay the process because you will be referred to DOT and they will adjudicate appropriately. CBP Act Specialists will inspect the packages for the required documentation, whether it's USDA, DOT, FDA, CDC. We will see the labels. We will not open the package. We will not expose our Act Specialists to harmful substances. We require those labels and those permits upon request. We will assist other agencies and we will initiate the, the interview of the person transporting those materials. And we will refer if we found a discrepancy. If a permit doesn't look legit, if the person doesn't have a permit, it will be referred. Leaking packages are secure and isolated prohibited entry bound for transfer to an approved facility. If we have to destroy, we will contract or outsource the destruction. CBP does not destroy. If we have to destroy, it will be at the expense of the importer or carrier. We use CBP Laboratories Scientific Services, or LSS, to guide us in that process, or even in the adjudication and collaboration with other agencies. If we encounter a package that it's damaged but not leaking, we will repair the damage with tape. Just secure and make sure that whatever is inside doesn't come out. Otherwise, if we cannot repair the damage, it will refer to the regulated agency and they will have to provide the guidance and most likely take custody of it. At the passenger environment, passen passengers are a high-risk pathway to introduce communicable diseases to include agriculture diseases, especially if that passenger visited a farm. We have plate signage and posters at ports of entry informing those passengers of agriculture requirements. We ask them to declare whatever they're carrying, especially if they're carrying biologicals. 
We provide an opportunity to passengers to declare whatever they're carrying. Failure to declare a prohibited agriculture product will result in a fine that could go up to $1,000 if you're one of our trusted travelers like Sentry, Global Entry, or Nexus. Hazardous material are not open by CBP, but are secure, isolated, and referred to the appropriate agency. Any prohibited item, again, will be seized and destroyed. We have about 48 partner government agencies that will have access and will be able to see shipments in real time using ACE, the automated cargo environment. This has been mandated and this year will be in effect. We will be using document image system, DIS, to facilitate and automate the use of documents associated with trade, permits, licenses, any documentation required by any of our government agency, our partners will be transmitted using DIS. That will expedite the process of releasing that shipment. This will include the CDC form 7537, which is the notice to owners and importers of dogs. The application to, to transfer select agents and toxin, the APHIS CDC Form 2. The permit to import or transfer etiological agents or vectors of human diseases. The permit to import African rodents, civets, or other turtles, rabies vaccination certificate, and many others. Thank you. And I'd like to thank the Detroit field office that I know they're listening right now. Thank you all. Thank you for the valuable information. The next speaker is Kimberly Orr. Dr. Orr is a microbiologist, Chemical Biologicals Control Division of the Bureau of Industry and Security, U.S. Department of Commerce, where in addition to licensing biological agents and equipment export, she also serves as the designated federal official for mat materials Technical Advisory Committee, Export Administration Regulations. Her topic is Export Controls for Biological Materials. Dr. Orr. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. Um, it's really great to present with other agency partners, and we've had great discussions already just sharing our missions, and it's really helpful to know who does what when people call and ask, because I get lots of questions. So my presentation, will start off talking about what would actually need a license from the Department of Commerce, um, and kind of give you some steps on how to figure out what you might need to do. Talk a little bit about genomic material, because that's often a topic that's a discussion. And technology controls, because frequently we're asked if someone needs an export license because they have a foreign worker in their lab or because they're going to send some technology discussions abroad. Uh, I have a few scenarios we'll run through to kind of see just some general um, thoughts on some situations that might arise and a really brief um, update on regulations. So the Department of Commerce 
um, the Bureau of Industry and Security, we, we have uh, export controls on a lot of things, dual use materials. Um, dual use materials can be almost anything, actually, a paper, pencil. For the purposes of this discussion, of course, we're talking about biological agents. Um, so most of our stakeholders for the biological materials um, are probably doing like commercial or academic work. Uh, but some of these items can actually be used to develop either weapons of mass destruction or medical countermeasures. So we have to carefully look at where these items are going and, and what their use is going to be. Um, export administration regulations list items by export control classification number. And we'll, di and we'll discuss some of the more common ones that uh, are associated with biological agents. And so first of all, we're going like, to talk about what might require export license. And just remember that there are other places who might need, you might need to get an export license. Um, maybe from um, Department of Defense Trade Controls, if something's listed under the USML. Or from the Office of Treasury if you're sending certain uh, medical items. So this, this slide on export control basics um, is useful for any type of item. Um, if, you're, if you're sending anything abroad, this is just a good place to start. You just look at part 72 of the export administration regulations, which tells you the steps for using the export administration regulations. The first thing you ask is what's the item? Do you know where it's going? because different countries determine whether or not a license is required. Also, who's going to use it? That can play into the, into the decision whether or not a license is needed. What are they going to do with it? That's another factor that can evoke a need for a license. And then you also just want to look at what the recipients do. Are they associated with certain foreign military powers? Is there something there that makes you think it might not be a, a wise um, idea to ship? Um, in Part 732 of the Export Administration Regulations, Supplement 1 through 3 have some really nice decision trees. Supplement, supplement 1 will tell you is your export license needed. And then tree number 2 will kind of help you decide if it's actually subject to the EAR. And then supplement 3 gives you some good guidance on um, what you should do to make sure that the person you're shipping to is, is reliable. It'll help you understand about denied parties and kind of tell you where you can go to look if you just want to make sure that you're not going to get yourself in trouble. So for any type of export, this is like where you should start. But in this situation, of course, we're just talking about biological um, items that might need an export license from the United States. Of course, it's, you know, the CDC and, and USDA APHIS are very important regulating things domestically, but when things have to go out of the country, you do need to like talk to the Department of Commerce. And I know sometimes that's confusing, but if it's exporting from the US, you should talk to the Department of Commerce. Um, so some of the things that might need a license, if you're gonna do an export, maybe you're collaborating with a, a university overseas, or you're sending something to a colleague, um, you would use uh, you would first of all look at the export administration regulations and certain export control classification numbers, 1C351, 1C353, 1C354. Now there's a group called the Australia Group and that's 41 countries, including the US, that get together and, and commonly discuss what agents that they want to control um, export amongst themselves. And then of course we have the select agent list which the CDC and USDA come up with, and those two lists are not exactly the same. Uh, in general, if you have any kind of biological agent, toxin, and genetic elements that's listed under one of these ECCNs, you're probably gonna need a license to almost anywhere, including Canada. Vaccines are a different story if they are either FDA approved or under clinical trial. Um, then they have an ECCN called 1C991, and it's very, very few places that would actually need a, um, a license for that. And then also biological processing equipment. Sometimes people collaborate, and they're sending like 
fermenters or things like that. We're not even going to really touch on that. At the end, I will give you a discussion on technology, um, more so on when you might need to deem to export license because that's usually the, the question that people have uh, of concern. And also remember re-exports, um, something that you sent to a lab in Germany, if they want to send it on to someone else, they may need to come talk to us about it. So the first things we want to think about, you have an item and you need to know uh, if you need a license. Um, the first thing you need to think about, okay, does it actually belong to the Department of Commerce? Um, there are also, there's also the U.S. munitions list uh, administered by the DDTC, and there's just been a new update to Category 14, which I'll discuss at the end. So you want to just make sure, first of all, that um, you're not doing something that would fall onto that ITAR list. Not very likely, but the first step is, does it belong to state? Does it belong to commerce? If you're not sure, um, so if you look at it and you figure, oh, no, it definitely should belong to commerce, but you're not sure if it has an export control classification number that's unique to it, then you can do what's called a commodity classification request. Uh, say you're working with a, a, um, an organism and you've modified it and you need to know, well, is it still requiring a license? You can do what we call a CCAT, um, and that's done the same way that you would do a commerce license application. Uh, so sometimes the items are what we call EAR 99, which means they don't have a specific listing in the EAR. And so often they, those items are no license required. But you also want to look at the red flags on the end users you need to look at like the entity list, which is um, on our web page. Um, you can go to like a, um, an Excel spreadsheet that has like constantly updated all the denied parties and foreign parties that you don't want to be doing business with. So it's not just what the item is or where it's going. It's like specifically who's it going to and what they're going to use it. You really always need to consider those sorts of things. So based on if it has a specific control number and where it's going, you might need a license. It might be no license required. And we also have things called license exceptions, which I'll discuss. Um, there are probably only two license exceptions that uh, apply for people working with uh, pathogenic agents. The first one is government, uh, GOV, and the details of that are on EAR 740.11. So if you're sending it to my colleague from Public Health Canada, you could probably use license exception GOV. You know, this is one thing you can call and talk to us, do commodity classification requests, whatever. Um, but if you go to 740.11, you can see a list of all the cooperating governments. And of course, Canada is one. Most of the, most of the Australia group um, nations are cooperating, country, cooperating governments. So if it's going to an agency of, the, of that government, then you have license exception GOV that you can consider. We also have a strategic trade authority, which is 740.20, and that allows you to send certain, mo most of the toxins on the list can go. However, it does have reporting requirements. It, it has a very broad um, application, only up to 100 milligrams, and no more than six shipments per, year, per calendar year. So it is, it can be used. People um, sometimes kind of have trouble wanting to use it, but our export and counseling service, we're glad to help people understand how it works because it is a way to send something without having to come in for a license. And whichever exception you choose to use, please read the regulations carefully. If you're not sure, just call us because we're glad to help. Um, so certain biological agents and toxins, this is like the meat of what we're all here to worry about today. So human, animals, and plant pathogens. Um, we have some that are Australia group controlled. We have some select agents not on the, select, not on the AG list. Uh, for us, if it's a select agent exempt status, it's probably still going to require um, an export control license. And we also have some controls for genetic elements of our listed pathogens and also vaccines. Again, for, uh, for something to be considered a vaccine, it either has to be 
like FDA or, or USDA approved um, or under IND cl clinical trials. And just because something is a vaccine uh, seed stock, that's not going to qualify it as a vaccine for this uh, for licensure purposes. And certain medical toxins also fall under 1C991. So when you talk about the commerce control list and you're talking about the Australia group versus select agents, for the most part, there's no exemption for quantity or attenuation. There are certain things, but you really need to read our regulations carefully. Um, the AG puts items on, on the AG list through a consensus process, so that they either come on or go off through consensus, and it's based on the history of the item and also their potential for causing serious harm public, you know, through public health or economics. Um, here's an example of a few select agents that aren't on the AG list. Um, the very few, mostly plant pathogens, actually. Uh, they're more AG-controlled um, items that aren't select agents, such as yellow fever. Um, and, and also some of the list of viruses, the list of viruses, because it, when you have 41 different countries, they all have, like, different concerns and for some countries, it's very important that um, rabies and other illicit viruses have some controls on them. So you will find a, a difference between the Australia group list and the select agent list. But the combination of those is in the export control regulations under 1C351, 1C353, or 1C354. When it comes to genomic material, it's only controlled under 1C353 if that agent is on the commerce control list. Um, so if it's not a pathogen listed in our regulations, the genomic material of that pathogen isn't controlled. So what we're looking at is genetic elements that have nucleic acid sequences associated with pathogenicity. Um, and if they code for toxins or, or toxin subunits. And when we're talking about viruses, most sequences are going to be assumed that, they have, that they're pathogenic. We're, they're, um, we realize that this language is confusing, and we are working to come up with a more detail, similar to what the CDC has done in describing what they consider um, a proper way to, to, um, to, to kill a virus or to, to neutralize a virus. We're trying to work on language, hopefully, in a couple of years, you know how it can take a while, where we'll be able to be more specific on exactly what's associated with pathogenicity is. Because right now we still have a pretty broad brush because with viruses, it's really hard to say what is capable of causing pathogenesis. And this also applies to synthetic, ele synthetic genetic elements. Uh, so the way we look at it, whole nucleic acids are controlled if they're non-infective. And again, this is like some stuff the CDC Select Agent Program has done some good work with. We also look at chimeric viruses and plasmids. Uh, and these are the kind of situations where we ask that if you're unsure, please maybe just submit a commodity classification request with details and we can go look at it and we can give you an affirmative answer on whether or not you should apply for a license. So in this case, if you had an Ebola virus and you took a segment of it and stuck it into a vesicular stomatitis virus, it would still be a controlled virus. Even if you took that GP and put it in a non-controlled virus, we would still consider it a controlled genetic element under 1C353. So these are the kinds of things that, that's what we're there for, send a commodity classification request in and we'll, we'll decide whether or not you're gonna need a license or not. So this is the money slide here. This is what you need to know um, to have a successful application for an export control license. A select agent exempt materials may need a license. Um, so just because it's not necessarily controlled under the select agent program, you still may need a license. Um, commerce control biological items are gonna need a license worldwide and that does include Canada. So please, just because it's Canada, don't assume you don't need a license. Um, we look at the recipient laboratory, and that, that, is, no, that is no shame on Canada. <laughs> That's just, it's everyone, it applies to everyone, right? 
Okay, so you're going to get to hear more about what you should and shouldn't do. So please tell us about where, um, who's going to be getting this item. And sometimes there's something called the ultimate consignee, who's the person who's going to receive it, and then they're going to pass it on to different end users. Well, we need to know about both of those people. And you also want to tell us, like, who is going to be your intermediate consignees, who's going to be delivery. We want to be able to kind of know how it's going to get from the U.S. to wherever it's going. We want to know a, a little bit about the researcher. We want to know like the name of the lab it's going to, any kind of supporting papers on their science. We need to know the end use of the item, and we want to know the biosafety level that the lab receiving it is capable of, and that they're going to agree to use that biosafety level. Please provide the amount of shipment, in other words, like 10 milligrams or five one mil vials. And even if it's just a pro bono thing, please put like at least a dollar for the cost shipping just to make the programming work out better. Um, if, if you have any dual use research concern activity or gain of function activity, please let us know. Um, it doesn't affect our licensing process, but it is something that um, some of our interagency partners will probably be interested in addressing. So if you can just up front tell us what's going on that way. It just makes it easier as we refer the license out. And again, if it's a vaccine seed stock, that's not a vaccine. So please consider that you're going to need a license. So this is how, this is how, we, um, this is how your license application works. First of all, someone's going to have a SNAPR account. They're going to up upload their... Um, information into SNAPR. And then it will get sent to a licensing officer in my division. At the same time, enforcement will take a look at it, and they will be checking that the people involved in, against a certain list and, and just evaluating um, if there's a potential for proliferation. Uh, so when the licensing officer gets it, they're going to look at the item, look at the export classification number assigned to it, see if it's the correct one. I think about the reasons it's under control, and then look at the destination. Um, look at all the parties, like I was talking about, the intermediate consignees, ultimate consignees, end users. Are there any available license exceptions? Is it going to a, a government of a cooperating country? Um, again, think about what they're saying they're going to use it for. Does that make sense? Is it, is it going to some place that would actually need that anthrax? And look at all the documentation. A lot of times people will send like uh, scientific publications to show that these people are doing this type of research or that this is an actual lab and that they are, uh, you know, that they have publications and that they're a legitimate recipient. So once we get it, depending on what the item in is and where it's going, we'll either refer it to the Department of State, the Department of Energy, and or the Department of Defense. Certain items don't have to go to all different agencies to, because we have delegations of authority. Some have to go to all. On occasion, we don't have to send it to any. But mostly, it'll go to at least the Department of Defense. Um, they will come back with a recommendation. Um, and so at any time in this process, we may return it without action. If the, if the information is incomplete, if it's not sufficient, if you don't respond to our questions, it may come back to you. Um, so we get it in. We have like nine days to get it out. The other agencies have 30 days to get back to us. So by day 39, we should have a recommendation from the U.S. government, and we should be able to validate it um, or deny it. And if it's denied, then there's all sorts of processes where you can appeal. Um, so that's a much longer um, – it, it, that could take up to like six months. But if it is denied, you do have the, the ability to appeal. And just real quickly, this is like if you had a, this is what the country con, uh, control chart looks like. So first of all, you look like, you go to the export administration list and you look at the ECCN. So if you had 50 milligrams of cholera toxin, that would be 1C351D. And you would see that reason for control is CB1, which means like any destination in the world, it's going to need a license. So this is Iceland, and that's the Australia group country. So if it was going to Australia, to the Iceland government, you could conceivably use license exception GOV. Uh, you also could, pro you could use STA, 
if it was one of the toxins that that's approved for. But this is what the commerce control country can chart looks like. So you can always like look at your country and then see um, what level of control is. So when we talk about technology, we think about is the technology for development, production, or use. It's much more applicable when we're talking about processing equipment. But when we're talking about the actual biological agent, if you're talking about development and production, we're talking about something that isn't in the public domain, isn't, fundam isn't fundamental research, is something that is uh, proprietary in nature, or is, needs to be kept out of the public information. Um, so we look at, is the technology related to, is the technology in the public domain, fundamental research in that point, we don't even uh, worry about a technology license. And then sometimes people have uh, a graduate student in a lab with a select agent, and they're like, do I need a deemed export license? Only if they are really looking, learning how to uh, manipulate that, that organism hands-on in a situation uh, that's not in the public domain or under fundamental research. So oftentimes that's like a commodity classification or discussion with us. But just because you have a foreign worker in a lab does not necessarily mean you're going to need an export license for the technology. Um, so a lot of this is covered under in part 734.3. And so something's already out there. It's not subject to the export administration regulations. Uh, if it's published or will be published. So there are lots of things that just are not subject to the export administration regulation. So these are just a few scenarios I'll go over really quick with you. If you have a lab and you have a researcher working with yellow fever, well, that's on the, that's on the AG list. So it's also, therefore, on the CCL. And um, the exporter, the researcher, wants to send it to a colleague in Kenya and use it for vaccine production. Well, at this point, it's just um, a 1C351 pathogen. There's nothing uh, that makes it eligible for a vaccine, uh, vaccine control. So yes, you'd need a license. If you have a foreign student in the lab on a different project, if he's not working with the pathogen, then there's, there shouldn't be any need for a deemed export license. I mean, you, you can always like send in a commodity classification. You can always call and talk to us if you're concerned. And even if they're working that, with that specific pathogen, it may not necessarily generate a need for a deemed export license. It just depends on what they're learning to do with that particular pathogen. So if the research continues and they generate a monovalent vaccine candidate, but there's no approval or IND number yet, and they need to ship it to their partner in Kenya, well, for us, that's still going to be considered 1C351 or 1C353, depending on how much modification they've done to it. If, um, say you pull in a foreign student um, from any country, and you're looking into it, and they are actually learning um, some way to make the yellow fever more pathogenic, or that's just not in the public domain, you might, there might be a need for a deemed export control uh, license at that point. But again, it's just something you want to just like talk to us about. Um, if you have a colleague who asks you for unpub unpublished methodology on increasing the yellow fever virulence, um, is that a text export? Well, there's several things you have to consider. Um, if it's published or about to be published, Possibly not. Again, you probably want to just talk to us. Um, if, uh, if you've got stuff that's going to be retracted or the agency that you're working for says you shall not publish, then you probably definitely are going to need to take an export license. So these things aren't, it's not just cut and dried, yes or no. Sometimes it's case by case, and we understand that it can be confusing, and that's why we're glad to talk and see if we can help. Uh, recent updates, they just published the new CAT 14 rule. Um, I think it came out July 28th. You have the Federal Register notices up there. It's going to take some things off the ITAR, some kind of uh, like decontamination equipment, and move it onto the um, commerce control list. 
It also is, actually has certain pathogens actually listed now, but it, it's just a regulation you need to read and think about, and if you have questions, um, please, uh, please let us know. And it's a, the DDTC reg, but um, just if, you know, just read it and look at it and, and see if, if, you, if you think after reading it that your organism now is going to be controlled by the, uh, the ITAR, by the USML, then it's time for commodity jurisdiction. Um, we recently had implementations, implementation of last year's Australia Group decisions, and basically we added SARS and reconstructed 1918 influenza, which was already on the CDC select agent list, so not really a change to anything, and some updated controls on bioprocessing equipment, um, but nothing of much significance. So this is how you can contact me. Uh, I'm always, we're, we're always glad to help, and we're always uh, glad to like partner with our, our fellow agencies and just try to help people remember that export controls generally fall to us, and uh, we're, we're always glad to help. Oh, and we're free. <laughs> it doesn't cost. It's just your time and effort and our time and effort. So thank you very much for your, your time. Another reminder before we go to the final speaker for today, please send your questions. Now it's your turn to turn in your questions, ipwebcast at cdc.gov. Our final speaker today is Ms. Tamisha Bullard. She is a senior wildlife inspector for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. She will talk about the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Import-Export Regulations. Ms. Willard. Thank you, Lourdes. Thank you for the invitation to come and present <clears throat> today. I'm very excited whenever I get to talk about the work of the Fish and Wildlife Service because I think that it's very important work. And so I thank you again for any questions that you have. Um, we're always uh, eager to, to uh, share what we do and hope that we make it more clear. So the mission of the, of the Fish and Wildlife Service is to conserve, protect, and enhance the nation's fish and wildlife and their habitats, and the continuing benefit of people. Oftentimes people don't know who Fish and Wildlife is and they confuse us with the state agency. And so um, hopefully I can make more clear today what, um, what the work of the Fish and Wildlife Service is and make clear what our import expert requirements are. So we have quite a few statutes that we enforce and we have quite a bit of overlapping jurisdiction with other government agencies. So we enforce the Lacey Act. And the Lacey Act basically gives us the authority to enforce foreign law, state law, and any other uh, law outside of our own. We have the Endangered Species Act. We have CITES. And CITES and the Endangered Species Act are different and we oftentimes uh, get questions and, and um, people think that they're the same thing. They are related, but they are different. We have some animals that are endangered that are also CITES protected. And then we have some animals that are endangered and not CITES protected. And then we have animals that are CITES protected but are not endangered. We enforce the African Elephant Conservation Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, Wild Exotic Bird Conservation Act, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, the Rhino Tiger Conservation Act, and the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act. Today I would like to just talk about how we fit into the conversation that we're having today. So Fish and Wildlife Service 
regulates the animal kingdom, basically. We regulate the import and export of exotic wildlife, but not for the purposes of human or animal health. However, we do have a part in our regulations, part 16, that is regulation of injurious species. So these are species that we have deemed that are harmful to um, native species, but is the only carve out in our regulations that has anything to do with disease. So we oftentimes, <laughs> we oftentimes um, have interesting conversations with our other government agencies that say, well, you know, can you prevent this from coming in because it's harmful to our native species? Only if it's on this list. And the type of species that we're talking about are snakehead fish, mitten crabs, walking catfish, and you can find the full list um, under 50 CFR Part 16. Many of these injurious species are imported for human consumption, but also for the pet trade. So we regulate them, but not for the same reason that some of our other government agencies do. I, I chuckled uh, when uh, some of the other government agencies were talking about their staffing levels. So we have 140 wildlife inspectors nationwide roughly, and we have 18 designated ports. So these are fish and wildlife designated ports, which means that there are other ports of entry, but they're not necessarily ports of entry for wildlife. So a designated port means that we have staffed these ports and you, know, you can import it or export at these ports 24 seven basically. And then we have 20 other locations along the northern and southern border. We're stationed at major international airports, ocean ports, and border crossings. We work passenger terminals and at airports and conduct inspections at international mail facilities. This is a map of our ports. So the green stars are our designated ports and then the blue dots are our border ports. We're also in Guam and Puerto Rico. And we know that um, Guam is not, is, is a US territory um, and Puerto Rico, so those are not uh, imports or exports if you are um, importing or exporting between them. So our wildlife inspections are personal baggage, cargo freight, live wildlife, U.S. international mail, freight carriers, both truck and rail, and we have a canine unit. We have seven dogs, and they are primarily um, at our designated ports, and we use them primarily for cargo and international mail. Didn't know that. <laughs> so these are inspector work, work locations. So as you can see, if you've ever seen a ocean cargo um, uh, seaport, it's intimidating. And so the cargo there, which is why uh, we developed our, our canine unit, is because they are so much better at finding shipments in uh, less amount of time than we are. We use them on air cargo, international mail, and at, at our border crossings. So these are just some of our personal baggage uh, inspections, and we're looking for anything from tourists and personal items, which include hunting trophies, live wildlife, scientific specimens, and small commercial shipments. Oh, there's my bush meat. <laughs> so this is a ship, uh, um, slide of our officers looking at uh, live tropical fish. 
which um, we're also looking for handicrafts, um, again, anything live and perishable, garments, products. And at the mail facility, we see quite a bit um, of everything. So increasingly, we are seeing more live animals, <clears throat> excuse me, more live animals being shipped in international mail. Um, and of course, it is not humane, and oftentimes they don't make it. And oftentimes that is one of the ways that we find them is that they have died during shipping, unfortunately. Um, but we see um, quite a bit of products and we are looking to make sure that everyone is in compliance. And so International Mail is pretty much 50-50 because we only have a limited number of International Mail facilities. And so if you are out of the country and you mail your shipment, you don't know where it's going to answer. And so um, it, this, is, this is quite a serious area for us. And then this is uh, <clears throat> us looking at ocean cargo. If you've ever been on the back of a truck, a semi-truck in 90-degree weather, trying to conduct any type of <laughs> inspection, it's, it's quite interesting. Um, I always think there's something that's going to jump out of the dark out of there at me. But um, so uh, we're, you know, basically looking at trucks or at rail cars. And, of course, we're at the border with our other uh, partner government agencies, inspecting vehicles, looking for live animals, um, especially smuggled live animals. And we get quite a bit of commercial uh, traffic as well. So this is an important definition for us. We have a different definition of import than our Customs and Border Protection colleagues. An import for us means that it enters um, or exits the jurisdiction of the United States. And so we oftentimes get this question um, on whether or not it has to be declared if it's going into a foreign trade zone. Yes, it does, because as long as it enters the United States, it is considered an importation for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I'd like to clear up some confusion about what trade is. So if you are going to conduct business using wildlife, whether it be a product or the live animal, then an import-export license with the Fish and Wildlife Service is required. And so we oftentimes get those who say that they are hobbyists. And that's another word for trade. Trade doesn't necessarily mean money. It just means a benefit. So um, hopefully we can clarify that um, license, an import-export license with the Fish and Wildlife Service is required unless it's personal or non-commercial, meaning scientific. We know that we get quite a bit of scientific specimens moving in and out, and as long as it is for, it is for official scientific research, we do have scientific research that is commercial. So, for example, pharmaceutical companies importing for the purpose of profit, even though it's for science, it is being imported for profit. Therefore, an import-export license with us is required. The license is good for a year. And so as long as you continue in that activity, you are required to renew your license. This is a list of the Fish and Wildlife Service designated ports. And the purpose of the designated ports is to make it, um, make it beneficial. Um, we prefer um, that if you're going to import or export wildlife that is federally protected, that you use these ports because we have staff at those ports and we can provide service to you. 
We also have what's called a non-designated port, and those are our Canadian port, border ports and our, um, our Mexican uh, border ports. However, there are 23, but only nine are staffed of the Canadian border ports, and you need permission to use these ports. And they are, if you um, want to use a non-designated port, you have to pay additional fees, and the purpose of that is because it takes additional staff. These are places that are not normally staffed by us or they are staffed with one or two people. So for example, for uh, Dunseeth and Pimita, we have two people. And so in uh, Sweetgrass, Montana, three. So they are you know, covering the whole border. So of course, if you, you know, don't want to use a designated port where you can come in 24-7 and you prefer to use one of those ports, then that is special service and we have to make special allowance for that service and that's why um, there is an additional cost. And there's a link on the slide that gives you a list of all the Canadian border ports. Same thing for the Mexican border ports. We have a list um, at this link and we have um, seven Mexican border ports, but only five are currently staffed. So in order to qualify for um, a designated port exception permit or a DPEP, the, an exemption to the requ um, required use of the certain ports for wildlife or import export wildlife can be granted by this permit. So the DPEP, which is valid for no more than two years, must be acquired prior to importing or exporting. So this is something that you have to get prior to the activity. A DPEP may be issued for single or multiple transactions and may be granted if the applicants can demonstrate that the use of the port is for scientific purposes, will minimize deterioration or loss, or will alleviate undue economic hardship. So there is criteria that you have to meet in order to qualify for the DPEP. Otherwise, there's an expectation that you would be able to make use of one of the 18 designated ports. The final criteria that must be made before the issuance of a DPEP is determination if we have the staff to service you. We certainly don't want to um, give any false hopes and issue a permit when there's no staff to be able to provide that service to you. So we require prior notice for certain wildlife. So for imports, we require 48 hour notice in advance of the import of live or perishable wildlife. The purpose of that is so that we can be prepared for you. Oftentimes, you know, if it's something venomous or something that requires um, additional uh, safety requirements, we wanna make sure that we have that in place. For the trade who are, are exporting, you must notify the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, 48 hours in advance of the export of any wildlife, whether perishable or not. And you have to make that wildlife available for inspection. So for trade importing or exporting um, at a port where DPEP has been issued, meaning it's a non-designated port, we require a minimum of 48 hour notice or what has been stipulated on that DPAP. There can be special conditions put on there that say 72 hour notice or whatever um, because depending on where that DPAP has been issued, it may take um, that inspector some travel time. So for example, we have a wildlife inspector in Port Huron, Michigan. And if you have requested a DPEP for Sault Ste. Marie, that's going to take a little while to get up there, also depending on weather. So that's why there are stipulations put on the, on the DPEP, and those are the conditions that you agree to. So this is the Fish and Wildlife Service declaration form. And I wanted to just put this up here because um, we have quite a bit of uh, importation happening as personal baggage. 
and I know that there is a customs declaration, but if it is a fish and wildlife service regulated commodity, in addition to whatever requirements you need to meet for customs and border protection, you also need to meet for fish and wildlife service. And this is important because this is the, you can do it online, you can do it electronically, but the most important thing is that we require very specific information like scientific names. And you can imagine sometimes the, the look that we get when we ask people for the Latin name of an animal and they're just like, um, it's a snake. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we want you to be prepared and so we try to give you as much notice as possible as to the type of information that you're gonna to have to provide. And if you want to import or export, this is the information that is required. And again, I wanna mention that this can be done online, electronically, ahead of time. So if you wanna be prepared ahead of time and make sure that your document is accurate, I suggest um, filing online with Fish and Wildlife Service and EDEX. And I wanted to put up an example of a CITES permit. So this is the, the permit that is required from the Fish and Wildlife Service if you are um, not just trading, but if you are importing or exporting any species that is CITES listed. And that is something that you will be required to know is if you're importing or exporting, you have to know how the animal is protected or if it is and the name of it. And what I wanted to point out um, for the CITES permit that is very important, if you are importing, then down at the bottom, there is a place that says endorsement. That is required in order for the permit to be valid so the endorsement includes um, a quantity. It includes a place for the foreign country to stamp and sign. The government officials have to stamp and sign it and endorse that this was what was allowed out. Just the issuance of a CITES permit is not enough. The endorsement is an additional security measure to say, okay, this is what it was issued for, but this is what was actually exported. Um, being a party, the United States is a party member to CITES, and one of our um, responsibilities is that we have to file an annual report every year, basically um, reporting the trade in CITES species. And one way that we do that is this information tells us what was actually imported into the United States. So we see quite a bit of CITES permits coming into the US and they are not endorsed. And that makes the permit invalid. So that's why I just wanna clarify that that is a very important area to make sure that has been completed. In addition to the whole thing being correct, of course, but the endorsement is very key. And if you are exporting, where the arrow is, that is a place, and it says right on it that it's not valid unless it has been signed by, um, by an officer. So even if you've obtained this CITES permit and you're exporting, if you don't get it endorsed by one of us, then your permit is invalid. So make sure that that is a, a detail um, that you pay attention to. When in doubt, ask. <laughs> it, it, we don't mind questions, and it is better to answer your questions now than to, you know, trying to work out um, a violation later. And I know, I work for Fish and Wildlife, you know, I, I have to, I have to put something in there to see if you're still awake. And I hope that if you have any questions that um, you have sent them in, um, or if you have questions after um, this presentation is over, um, that you contact me, and this is my information. Thank you for your time. It is now time for the question and answer session, presenters, 
Come up the stage and please take your seats. Reminders to the registered participants, we're still taking questions. Please send your questions to ipwebcast at cdc.gov. We have dedicated staff who will be taking your questions, Lieutenant Commander Meredith Pyle and Dr. Janet Wilson. Please direct it to the federal agency involved. Our first question is for DGMQ. What documentation is required to import civet cat material? The easiest thing to do would be, I'll direct you to the animal imports um, email site and because we'll need more information about what live animals versus the materials how much you plan on importing, um, and final destination. So if you're interested in importing that, I would just direct you directly to the CDC animal imports at cdc.gov, and then we'll be happy to provide information that way. And also, <laughs> and also um, address your questions to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, because you will need to declare that to us as well. It doesn't matter what the purpose is, because you're importing an exotic animal, it requires fish and wildlife clearance as well. Thank you. The second question is for APHIS. Is the USDA permit for a specific investigator or does it cover an organization, for example, a university? Someone needs to be responsible for the materials so it's, the permit is given to a person. Next question is for import, import permits. What is the Institute's liability if we take the time to secure a CDC permit and the sender fails to abide by the permit requirements? The regulation specifically states that the, uh, like you said, the importer should um, assist the sender with those requirements. And if the importer uh, performs that task, there should be no liability to the importer for that situation you described. This question goes out to the entire panel. Please provide clarification on what import documentation is required to import established non-human primate cell lines into the U.S. For the CDC import permit program, all non-human primate material requires an import permit. Nothing, um, nothing for us. Oh, okay. From APHIS, uh, nine, nine, I don't believe non-human primate cell lines require a permit. We have a guideline for that. However, if it's been exposed to, to FBS, then it does require a permit. Did I cover everything, Saeed? Yes, I did. Fish and Wildlife requires that be declared, and also all non-human primates are CITES listed, so a CITES permit from the exporting country will be required as well. Next question is for CBP. We are bringing non-infectious material in with us on a flight. Do we have to declare this material if it is accompanied by a certification statement? The answer is yes, you have to declare it. This question also addresses the entire panel. We are a small company planning to move to a new lab location. 
Once the move is completed, do we need to apply for new CDC, FWS, USDA import export permits, or is there a way to just submit an address change? With the CDC import permit program, a new permit will need to be, a new application will need to be submitted for a new permit. And the reason for this is to capture the new address for the new location because that's going to be on the face of the permit and that's where the material will be sent. If, it, if you had an export license, you would need to let us know and I believe you would need a new license as well. If your license with Fish and Wildlife Service, you would just submit an amendment to update the, the address. USDA APHIS, you would submit an, an amendment, assuming that you're continuing to move materials across state lines. Next question is for APHIS. Do you need a USDA permit for mosquito-borne viruses like Zika? We don't regulate Zika virus because at this time I don't believe we know that it affects any animals that we're concerned with, um, livestock or poultry. However, if the Zika virus has been exposed to animal products such as eggs or FBS, those would be the most common, then a permit is required. I would just add that if you're using macaque or non-human primates to import the Zika virus, then you would need to also um, declare with Fish and Wildlife Service. Okay, this question is for the entire panel. If an individual needs a CDC import permit for a zoonotic agent that affects livestock and poultry, do they also need any other additional import permits? If, if the agent also affects humans, um, they would need a permit from the import permit program. If the agent affects livestock or poultry, would, they would need a permit from APHIS. But you already asked, added that into the, the question. Okay, the next question is for CBP. I have an import permit for material from Mexico. Do we have to declare the material to CBP when we drive across the border, or can we wait and see if we are asked about it before declaring it? All material needs to be declared upon entry. This question is for everyone. After an import is received, what documentation is required to be maintained by the recipient? That's a really broad question because it really depends on what you're importing um, for um, the impact team. So if it's a non-human primate import, we have restrictions and regulations on how long you need to maintain that paperwork so that we can verify you know, a year from now, two years from now, three years. So I think that's, I'm not sure how that panel's gonna address that question when, unless yours, you can refer to a specific import. From, from APHIS, I think we would want the permit itself and any supporting documentation, such as statements that have been required by the shipper. Years, I don't know the answer to that one. Yeah, I, would, I would agree, same for CDC import permit program. If you retain the permit that we've approved for you to have and uh, the documentation that came with the ship, and I would think that that would be, would be required. From APHIS, I would also like to add that um, if you import a material and you know the permit is expired one year, but you may have that material for many more years, and you don't need to renew that permit just to have it, uh, but as long as you have this material, and you must keep all the documents, the importing documents and chain of custody. Thanks. The next question is for everyone. 
Does your agency require an additional permit to transfer imported material to collaborators within your state or to another state? For the CDC import permit program, it would depend on um, <clears throat> the agent being imported. Um, normally, we require the import permit for um, importing imp importing infectious material into the country from outside of the country. But if there is uh, any um, policy changes within the CDC's import permit program, um, like associated with novel agents like MERS coronavirus or H7N9, um, then those will require further uh, documentation if you're going to transfer them. So you would need another import permit from us so we can track that information. From, from organisms and vectors, the recipient needs a permit to receive the materials across state lines. There is no permit for shipping. If the material is not moving across state lines, a per, the recipient does not require a permit. However, all recipients must abide by local and state regulations. For Fish and Wildlife Service, if you have obtained a permit that allows certain activity, let's say, to uh, possess certain species, then you have to maintain whatever those requirements were that you were issued the permit under. Otherwise, the import-export permits are for U.S. Um, jurisdiction in and out of the U.S. only. And from CDC um, impact, uh, DGMQ um, point of view, specifically for non-human primates, if they're still within their quarantine period, um, there is definitely some restrictions on they have to if they are moving for whatever reason during that quarantine period, they can only move to another quarantine facility and permits must be maintained by both quarantine facilities and they have to notify us that they're actually moving them during the quarantine period. And there's a restriction on how they have to be moved while they're in quarantine. So if it's non-human primates moving during a quarantine period, then yes, the CDC animal imports at cdc.gov at .gov is a way to get in touch with us. This next question is for everyone. Do you need any permits to send a vial of lysed green monkey kidney cells from the U.S. to Romania? <clears throat> you would only need a permit if you, from the export license from Commerce if you knew that it was like purposely infected with um, a pathogenic agent, just in general, cell lines and things like that are what we consider EAR-99. So it's not very, uh, you still want to consider where it's going to, who it's going to, and make sure that you're not sending it to someone who's on a denied party list. But for the most part, things that are EAR-99 aren't going to need a license. The only exception is if you have taken it and you know it's um, infected with the virus that they're going to try to recover, in which case we would, prob we would uh, require an export license. Yes, Fish and Wildlife. The situation you described does not fall under the CDC import permit regulations. APHIS organisms and vectors permits only import, not export. Import and interstate transport. This next question is also for the entire panel. Do we have to notify anyone when the imported material has been destroyed? Only if that is a um, criteria of your permit. Typically for CDC import permit, the answer is no. But um, if there's some other um, situation or stipulation on your permit, then, then it's possibly. But uh, we haven't had that situation to happen yet. If you had an export license, um, there might be a condition that it would be destroyed um, at the end of the, um, of the experiment, but there's no requirement that you notify us. APHIS organisms and vectors, there is no requirement to notify of that, we, that you destroy the organism. The next question is for CBP. Are all biologicals required to go through a formal entry process?
All cargo shipments need an entry. Hand carry, if you don't have a permit and we have to detain the shipment or the package, yes. If you have a permit on the passenger environment, you don't need to do an entry. But if you lack a, an ent uh, the license or the permits, we will transfer the, the biologicals to cargo and then you will require an entry. And also, I think it depends on the value of the product you're importing. So I will need more information. Next question is for APHIS. Do the imports of mouse cell lines containing less than 10% FBS as a nutritive factor fall under the USDA guideline 1120? No, thanks. This next question is for everyone. Do you need a permit for the importation of sewage or environmental water with unknown contents? If that sewage or environmental water contains material that is um, infectious, uh, if it's known or, or suspected to contain infectious material to human, then it would need a permit um, from the CDC import permit program. If, if it's unknown and it's not rendered non-infectious, then I would suggest that a permit is, is uh, required from the CDC. I'd have to say the same, that you need to tell us what organisms you suspect in there, and if they are livestock or poultry pathogens, then a permit would be required. This next question is for DGMQ. CBP mentioned a CDC permit requirement to import human remains. How is this permit obtained? Again, if you just contact the CDC Animal Imports, I know that sounds like a weird email address for human remains, but that is the correct email box, CDC Animal Imports at cdc.gov, um, because it really depends if the person died from a quarantinable communicable disease or not, and how the body has been prepared prior to transfer. Um, so the easiest way is to um, contact us at the email box. We'll get a little bit more information for you, and then if a permit is required, will assist you in getting that permit. This question is for everyone. Does your agency charge a fee for a permit? If so, how much is it? We're free. <laughs> CDC info <and> permit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, export licenses are free. Under CFR 9, Part 130, we're allowed, uh, USDA is allowed to, to charge for permits, and we charge $150 for a new permit. Uh, CDC, DGMQ, we do not have any users fee, user fees at this point in time, so we do not charge for any permission letters or permits. Our Division of Management Authority is our office that issues permits, and yes, there is a charge. I don't have, um, since there are several applications, if you go to our website, you can see the list of charges attached to whichever uh, permit that you're applying for. The next question is for everyone. Approximately how long does it take to receive a permit after an application is received? Well, if you're talking about an import-export license, um, I believe they say up to 60 days. Um, but for the uh, CITES permits and other uh, federal list of permits. Again, our Division of Management Authority issues those, but I believe that they normally say 60 days. Not that it takes that long, but I think they have that long. 
CDC DGMQ does not have any uh, specific time frame in the regulations, but we do the best to turn it around as quick as possible. Um, most of our turnarounds within uh, less than a week, but if we have a public health emergency event going on, such as Zika, currently right now, our responses are a little bit delayed, but we have no time period that we need to respond in our regulations. APHIS can turn around a permit in a day if it's an emergency. Otherwise, I'd say it takes a couple of weeks if we have all the information that we need and the person who is, for if it's an import permit, is importing from countries that we're not concerned about, not using materials that we're concerned about. If there's an inspection required, that is going to take longer, and it depends on the availability of both the recipient and the inspector in whatever part of the country that they're at. Forty days is um, kind of what's regu uh, mandated in the regulations. Sometimes we can do it much faster if we have delegations of authority where we don't have to refer them out to all the different agencies. Sometimes if we're talking about a live biological agent, it can take longer because other our uh, agency partners may come back with questions or we may need to have discussions about the biosafety level of the receiving lab. Um, Normally, even if it's a biological, I would say we would have it back to you in 45 days. On occasion, we've it's taken like 60 to 90 days, um, but sometimes we some things we can get out in two or three days if, if we don't have um, st uh, if we have like some delegations of authority, we can get it out fairly fast. For CDC import permit programs, typically 15 business day turnaround. Um, if it's in response to an outbreak, we can get items out within 24 hours. And if it's associated with an inspection, um, it, it, it may be held um, even longer until the inspection uh, letters are adequately addressed and closed. Um, yeah, I forgot we also have like an expedited processing um, system if it's an emergency. Next question is for the entire panel. What is the standard for determining if animal tissue samples collected during field research requires permits in the absence of extensive testing for zoonotic or animal pathogens? Would you please repeat that? What is the standard for determining if animal tissue samples collected during field research require a permit with, in the absence of extensive testing for zoonotic or animal pathogens? In that regard, um, if this, the material, like I said before, is known or suspected to contain, so if it's not known, it's potentially suspected to contain an agent that's infectious to humans, a permit would be required. If it's, uh, it also depends on you know where the material is coming from, uh, what's endemic to the area, and um, with all that information, if if uh, there's no testing to determine what uh, agent might be present, I would recommend uh, getting a, a permit uh, for that material unless it's rendered non-infectious. And as far as the export license goes, definitely if we knew it was infected, we would be requiring a license. Um, if it's just soil samples or something like that, um, we can evaluate it on a case-by-case -case basis depending on, um, I mean, obviously if it's from an area where there's a lot of anthrax, um, um, we would probably just assume that, that it's infected. Um, but um, it's kind of like we'd, we'd probably want to do commodity classification or, or talk about it. For APHIS, it depends what is the animal tissue and what country did it come from. For my section, organisms and vectors, we were going to want to know if it's infected in any way and, um, and it's, if it's been exposed to animal products or if it's been exposed to other animals and what are they. There's a whole long list of things. So the standard would be if it's collected from an animal that's not livestock or poultry, and it's in a country that doesn't have any of the diseases that we're concerned about, organisms and vectors would not permit it.
for fish and wildlife, we need to know what the animal is to know if it is a fish and wildlife regulated animal and then therefore how it was protected would determine whether or not a permit was required. Okay, and the last question is for the entire panel. If there is a mistake on an issued permit, must the applicant resubmit an application? Depends on the mistake. So if it's an email address or, I mean, if it's, a, if it's a, an amendment, um, but if it is the purpose has changed or the importer or exporter has changed, then yes, um, it's possible that the application would be required. For APHIS, we usually ask for some kind of something in writing that you're asking to amend. A whole new permit, a whole new application is not required, just uh, a letter telling us what it needs to be changed. So this mistake is on the, the actual permit or the application? Question says on the issued permit. Okay. So for CDC, if, if that mistake is generated from um, uh, an error on our part, then we would not require the, the uh, customer to send in another uh, application. If it's a mistake on, on the, uh, the part of the applicant, and which would probably affect the face of the permit, then we would request an updated application so we can address that uh, matter and, and provide a new permit with the updated information. Uh, yeah, our, our regulations clearly state in which circumstances require um, a new license to be issued. So it, it just kind of depends on what the circumstances are. CDC DGMQ is pretty much the same way as CDC DSAT. So if the mistake is on our part, then we'll correct it. Um, but if for some reason it was changing um, because the facility you decided to move from one facility to the next, then yes, you would probably, uh, although we do have permits through the IPP program for certain things, a lot of our other items are, and animals are um, permission letters granted. And so we would actually have to have an update for that permission letter to be updated. Okay, thank you. Thank you, presenters and uh, participants. That concludes today's webcast. We have more speakers, and you, we will continue presentations tomorrow, Thursday, August the 4th, at 12 noon. <laughs>